I want to talk about prostate cancer and, and, and the high-risk prostate cancer and how surgery, the role of surgery has changed. And I, knowing many of you guys here in the public, uh, many have been being patients of Professor Marburger and, and other friends. You have uh, mostly undergone some sort of primary therapy, many of you, be it radiation or pro uh, radical prostatectomy. Um, I want to also put the challenge to my very close friend, Gregor Goldner. I work very closely with him. We share a lot of patients where the role in high-risk prostate cancer for surgery or radiation is. I want to take, I want you to go away on this talk with one thing. There is no one person or one size fits all. Everybody is going to be different and it matters and from who is the main stakeholder is a patient. It's a shared decision making between the patient, his family, his worries and the physicians what the right treatment for that individual patient is. So what I'm going to tell you is a little bit the data and putting a little bit of challenge to my friend but uh, at the end it is very varied from patient to patient. These are my disclosures. We have to give them a little bit because we all work very closely with the industry to advance new therapeutic modalities. I wanted to also start with two or three slides for our guest international slides about the Medical University of Vienna who made this room and a lot of the amenities possible. The Medical University of Vienna uh, is one of the leading centers in Central Europe. The uh, first one in uh, German-speaking university in Central Europe was in Prague and then we had the University of Krakow, which, is, which was in Polish, and then eventually Vienna, 1365, and the Medical Institute was one of the founding uh, uh, faculties. Today we teach 8,000 students. Education is at the heart of the matter for us. Education to you patients, empowering you, but also to the next generation of doctors and healthcare allies that will go forward and make a difference. Uh, we have 1,600 physicians, and this is where we work. Sorry, this is where we work, uh, um, and so on. Um, we see approximately 540,000 outpatients uh, a year at this university uh, uh, hospital. That means approximately somewhere between two to 4,000 patients a day. In urology, we see 25,000 outpatient cases. Uh, and we perform 4,400 surgeries in a year. Science is at the heart of this institution, then only through science and innovation we're going to change how things are done in the society and we're going to get away of this a little bit outdated therapies and create a better future for us all and all the patients. And we at the uh, at the uh, um, university at the Department of Urology have been, have been at the forefront of that and this is the rate of scientific publications you can see that have risen since the last three years and mostly on prostate cancer and cancer. Uh, the heart of changing the future of medicine and I think that's what's going to prevail today in the sessions is certainly prevention and then translation of the knowledge that we have to clinical trials and also from clinical trials that evidence to you patients exceptionally important and then hopefully getting to a precision medicine approach. So precision medicine is we have to realize we all are different. Our needs, our fears, our social structures are different. Our desires are different. From one patient, sexual function is more important. For example, the example that was given before, a young man may want a few years more sexual function. He's not going to get treated immediately. He's going to stay on active surveillance. The other guy, he's worried. He has young kids. He wants the problem to be solved. He's risk averse. They're all different. They're all different. So precision medicine is not only newer drugs, but it's also bringing the patient and his family into personalized medicine. Vienna Medical School, as Michael Marberger has said, has been at the forefront of cystoscopy and urology for many years. There's been a lot of wonderful people working here with seven Nobel Prize leaders in medicine. Uh, um, and not a Nobel Prize leader, but Ignaz Semmelweis, which is actually from Hungary, did his main discoveries here, but he was chased away, but he was, uh, he was one of the leaders. Theodor Billroth being eventually the first radical prostatectomy. He did milestones in many surgeries, but also in a precision point of view, taking science to 
uh, uh, better medicine, Karl Landsteiner with the ABO groups and so on. And that legacy is what we live on. Coming to the talk, high risk prostate cancer, be it or in general prostate cancer, it comes to the one of the questions that one of my mentors when I was living in the United States and is the father of urologic oncology in the United States asked. Himself being afflicted with the disease. Is cure possible when it's necessary? What does that mean? He very early on understood that many patients have a cancer that may not need a cure because the side effects are too high or because that cancer will not affect the life expectancy or the quality of life of the patient at all. And to that comes how to best achieve cure when cure is necessary. You have to realize that in the past, we urologists have made many mistakes as a society. Uh, we have treated the low risk cancers with surgery which today we know and we have heard may not need an intervention. In the high risk prostate cancers, we have just said nothing for you to do. Go on hormone therapy. And eventually all these clones of cancer cells become resistant and the patients fail. So at the heart of this matter of the question of Willett Whitmore is what we call personalized medicine. The right therapy at the right time for the right tumor, so understanding a tumor biology, for the right patient. And that is the patient at the end that matters. So we've heard, I want to just, because we do a lot of talk about the problems of PSA, I want to just, again, put this out there, and my friend uh, Peter has already talked about it, that prostate cancer mortality is decreasing, and it's certainly decreasing to a large part because of PSA screening or PSA use, and uh, it accounts for 20% of the overall reduction of cancer mortality in men. Now show that in any other cancers, and I will kiss your hands. The rate of metastasis has decreased dramatically. This is a totally different disease we're facing today. Now I want to put that out there because we have heard about the PLCO study the American screening study from Gerald Andriol presenting it, saying, you know, actually PSA screening does not impact cancer-specific mortality. Totally contrary to the European data, and that has led the United States, the US Preventive Task Force, saying, you do not need screening. What happened, there's a recommendation D. Two, one year ago, they actually looked at the PLCO study and found that over 90% of the patients that were in the control arm of the PLCO eventually got a PSA testing. That means that study is totally useless. That has brought the US Preventive Task Force to reassess the position and then moving from a D recommendation to a C recommendation. That means today, they come into where the EAU and the AUA and every other patient advocacy group has been standing. That means discuss with the patient about the benefits, risks, and harms of PSA screening. Because before they were saying, do not even mention it. That's going to change the legal situation and also the GPs, and we talked about it, how they're going to talk about PSA, because they have to address it now to a certain degree. But we have been, as Anton put it, part of the problem. The part of the problem was because we thought detect all, treat all. Very radical approach. Heavy repeated screening was our attitude and no deferred treatment. Every patient needs immediate aggressive treatment. Very wrong approach. And we learned from it, so we became a little bit more refined. Now we say detect all, treat some. Right? So that is a lot of screening and biopsies and then surveillance to those patients who may benefit from it. And we have heard it in a previous talk. But I wish we could go to this. I wish we could get to detect some and treat some. I do not even want to detect low risk prostate cancer because I don't want to create the anxiety that my colleague was talking about, anxiety on PSA's uh, active surveillance and just the mental stress of it. 
So I think that it's very important that we do not need to detect all of them, and still, those that we detect, to be very smart to see which ones we need to treat. So here in Vienna, at the medical university, uh, since 2003, we have a concept of smart prostate cancer screening based on four rules. Very simple, we always have to make it simple, we're urologists. Is one, don't screen men who will not benefit. That means, based on comorbidities and age, some may not never need a PSA, because it just creates problem. Now, there might be a 70-year-old that is totally fit and has a life expectancy of over 10 years. That guy, you're certainly gonna get a PSA. Don't biopsy men without a good reason. What happened with a good reason, and, and Peter talked about it, PSA, repeat PSA, but you see only that uh, PSA velocity, small changes, it's not a good reason. So there should be a reflection when to biopsy. Don't treat unless you have, that is what Anton has talked about, active surveillance, and if you have to treat, and that is another area we need to fight for, do it at high volume centers. This concept in our countries, and many of your countries are similar, that everybody can do everything with poor outcomes and we don't even measure what the outcome is, is a huge problem. That is where the suffering from prostate cancer happens to a large area. Redundant treatments, unnecessary treatments, a lot of side effects. Good. I hope that you have seen from Anton Ponholzer's talk that radical prostatectomy should rarely be used for low-risk organ-confined prostate cancer and having imaging and MRI, we talked to the break, being the patients, identifying the patients will be essential. I hope I can in the next 10 minutes convince you that radical prostatectomy is a highly effective <laughs> treatment for intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer. Now, I want you to understand that when I'm saying radical prostatectomy, I'm looking for the surgical point of view, but every single patient should be looked at in a multimodal therapy approach. And that the future is truly treating those that need it most, and that is where Stefan Mannesbacher is going to come in, talking about locally advanced and lo uh, oligometastatic prostate cancer. I hope that in the future, Gleason 6 prostate cancer may change a little bit in our perception. It occurs normally with aging, it is associated with inflammation. But the main issue is to identify if there's another Gleason 7 somewhere else, which we don't know. Gleason 3 prostate cancer does not have any of the biological hallmarks of a cancer. It does not have any of them. In all these uh, biological molecular patterns are not there. It actually has been shown that Gleason 6 prostate cancer does not metastasize to lymph nodes. Now you would say, should we change the name of Gleason 6 prostate cancer to something else? And many of my colleagues say, no, we shouldn't. I don't know, I don't know the answer to it. But I want to just make you aware that in a thyroid cancer, just two years ago, 20% of the thyroid cancers have been reclassified as no cancer. So changing the name has resulted in 20% of the thyroid cancer not getting any more the aggressive treatment. That could happen to Gleason 6 prostate cancer. But we, with the pathologist, the ISUP has come up with a prognostic grouping. So when you now see Gleason score 6 or 7, 3 plus 4, you have the prognostic group, and only that determination from the pathologist to call it prognostic group one is to empower the physician and the, and the patients that he may not need treatment. It's the only reason it was created. Good, we have seen this, that radical prostatectomy compared to watchful waiting in higher grades and stage patients improves mortality, cancer-specific mortality, metastasis, and need for hormone therapy. Good results. But we have also have to look at it that it does only give that benefit in high-risk prostate cancers, not in the low-risk or intermediate-risk groups. The same we have seen the PIVOT trial that was radical prostatectomy versus observation. No benefit if you look all people together. 
no benefit because the low risk patients, whether you're going to give observation radical prostatectomy, no difference. In the intermediate, probably no difference. Difficult to see, follow up needs to be longer. But in the high risk group, radical prostatectomy saved life. So who we need to treat really is the high risk patients. Now how does radical prostatectomy in the high risk patients perform? And that was always a problem. One of the biggest advocates for prostate cancer, Patrick Walsh, said if you're high risk, forget about it. I'm not going to treat you because there's nothing I can do for you. Now he's re-looking at this and said maybe I treated the wrong patients all my life long. Actually if you look at Whatever definition of high risk, is it the Gleason score, the PSA, the local the advancement and so on, radical prostatectomy does exceptionally well as first step of a multimodal therapy. Actually 40% of the patients may never need another therapy. And those that will need another therapy will need radiation as part of a sandwich treatment or additional hormonal therapy part early on. Even the high risk, there are different groups. There is very high risk, which is high Gleason score, locally advanced, and PSA very high. Those patients will do very poorly. Those, we should think about multimodal therapy with, system, with radiation hormones, probably. And those uh, uh, that are intermediate risk, probably radiation therapy in my heart, I think, often. And those that are good prognosis that have only one factor, probably a single therapy alone will be sufficient. But when we talk about radical prostatectomy, we also should talk in a high risk about a well-done lymphadenectomy. And that is a main issue, as often has happened, with new technologies coming. You do robotic, you do laparoscopic surgery, oh good, but it changes, suddenly you take less lymph nodes. So we need to be aware that high risk means also an extended lymphadenectomy because most of the lymph nodes that you're going to find are in areas that are outside of the typical area of lymphadenectomy done by most surgeons. And there's actually a randomized trial shown that, sorry, that in intermediate and high risk patients, randomized a lymphadenectomy improves by chemical recurrence and hopefully all also survival. But when we talk about surgery or even radiation, no matter what therapy, it needs to be done at the center of excellence. And we need as patients to be able to see the results of the physician. Mostly you go to a physician and say, what are the results? He said, you know, he will quote you a paper he has read, not his own results. And then you ask him, what are your results? And he will give you some random numbers. Is it true? Is it really his numbers? No, it's not true. He's imagining that. The only way of measuring your outcomes is having patient-related outcome measures and where the patient fills those out and they're reported by the patient to a certain data set in real time, not by the physician or what his perception of the patient's side effects and so on are. Complications are less if done at high volume centers. Cancer-specific survival, surgical margin and PSA recurrence are better at high volume centers with experience. Continence and potency are better at high volume centers. Now, here I come to the heart of the matter, high risk prostate cancer. I have high risk prostate cancer. What should I get? And that is my challenge to my very close friend, Gregor Goldner, is just to tease him. But I think that most of these patients should be considered, if possible, and the patient desires. Now, I'm talking about only about the scientific part. First, with a radical prostatectomy, and then, as part of it, multimodal therapy. There is no evidence from high-level research to support this part. This is my belief. The only evidence is from retrospective data. Here are 1,000 patients treated by the best radiation oncologists high grade, 81 grade, and the best radical prostatectomies. And what did they find? They found that radical prostatectomy reduces the risk of metastasis and death from cancer, but only in the high risk patients. And it has not to do that radical prostatectomy is really that much better than radiation in these patients. It's because when you do radical prostatectomy as a first step, you're more likely to get a second therapy of benefit, a radiation early on, early 
adjuvant radiation therapy or early severe therapy, which in a radiation group you're not that likely to get. Now this is the a population based data set from the capture in the United States showing that radical prostatectomy increased the risk uh, 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 is, uh, lowers the risk of mortality compared to radiation. It's not because radiation, I think, is that much weaker. It's because it's often given alone or with hormones, and that is not sufficient because you don't kill the lethal clone of prostate cancer. That is also institutional data from Mayo Clinic showing just the same thing. And this is a huge uh, Swedish data set showing that radical prostatectomy actually does better than radiation in the high-risk prostate cancer, but only in those that are young and low comorbidity. But not alone with radiation, but in the sequence of before. That is also what is changing in the United States. Low-risk prostate cancer is getting less surgery, thanks God. Intermediate, a little bit more surgery, radiation staying stable, probably they should pretty equal in the high risk the number of surgeries is increasing uh, as part of model model therapy. My last three slides, as a, a, a muse bouche, as an aperitif to uh, Stefan Madersbacher's talk, the new land for surgery in prostate cancer is going to be probably in the oligometastatic cancers. With new imaging, you have all heard about it. PSMA, PET, and so on. Now we're finding these oligometastatic cancers that before we were not aware were present that common and were the cause of these early biochemical recurrences. Now that we're discovering them, I strongly believe that the first step in the multimodal therapy should be a radical prostatectomy because we want to get rid of those intraprostatic castration resistant early clones of lethal prostate cancer. There is mouse data to support that. This is one study. There is population-based data, poor quality, to support that in oligometastatic, that local, local therapy is absolutely necessary. And there is also data from one study that is well done, that Stefan will talk about it, where six months of hormone was given and then a radical prostatectomy was done in oligometastatic patients. And the most interesting finding of that study was every single patient after six months of radical prostatec uh, hormone therapy, despite a PSA response, had vital cancer in his prostate still alive. And these are the clones that will come after you. We just have uh, shown at the EAU an abstract of our center with Heidenreich showing that it has fantastic result, but this surgery is a different surgery with a lot of side effects. So I hope in this afternoon we will talk about the side effect management because that has not received the attention it needs. I think in the next 10 years we're going to see better molecular characterization for the biopsy. Gleason grade is just not enough. We have biomarkers that are there, imaging that is there to identify indolent and aggressive and the metastatic phenotype. Imaging we're not spending a lot of time on imaging in this meeting, but imaging is at the heart of the issue. We're going to talk about it when we're going to talk about biochemical recurrence. Focal and partial gland ablation, I believe, will be one of the things that will come into the future. Not yet ready, as Professor Marburger and Anton Pollenholz have said, and only in clinical trials, but it will become. And surgery will change dramatically therefore high volume centers because it will become smart surgery where intra surgery you will make the decision based on molecular finding and imaging intraoperatively. Uh, ORs will be hybrid ORs and I think that the work with radiation and systemic therapy will even be closer as we are merging into one identity specifically for the high risk prostate cancers. I'm trying to train my next generation of doctors to think differently. We are in a new age. We first have learned as surgeon to be anatomist and pathophysiologist, as you see Rembrandt's image. Now, the last 10 years, molecular information has entered in our decision making. And that has led 
to a lot of progress. It will revolutionize how we will think about many diseases. But with this image, there is something deeply wrong. That is that the patient has disappeared. And we see only organs, and we see only molecular data. And realizing there is a human behind it, a human with feelings, a human that could be you, your family, is essential. And not losing that human touch in the care of prostate cancer or any disease is essential. So to answer Whitmore's dilemma, I think that today we can say, compared to the last 20 years, we have made major progress. But we have not fulfilled our promise to the patients. Yes, we can give the right therapy to the right cancer at the right patient at the right time, but we don't do it in 100% of the cases. We need to get to that tangible 100%. Every patient loss, every complication, every side effect is to be seen as a failure and as an impetus to become better. Thank you very much.